my name is Tekla Harms. I'm the chair of the geology department at Amherst, and I've inserted myself into these proceedings somewhat on an ad hoc basis because I want the pleasure of introducing your speaker. Uh, Emily Stewart Lakdawalla was one of my early thesis students in the geology department, one of the best, uh, most brilliant, and I've been very pleased to watch her go on and get a master's degree in planetary science with the great Jim Head at uh, Brown University. Uh, and then to go on to the Planetary uh, Society, where she's held a number of posts, but today her title is Senior Editor, Senior Editor and Planetary, planetary Evangelist. I was going to say Planetary Evangelist Extraordinaire, I'm not sure, but uh, mm -hmm. definitely Extraordinary. This will be a great talk, and I hope you can sit back and enjoy. Thank you very much, Tekla. I'm touched by that introduction. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Emily Lakdawalla. I'm the senior editor and planetary evangelist for the Planetary Society, which is a nonprofit organization that was founded by Carl Sagan, Bruce Murray, and Lou Friedman in 1980 to advance uh, space exploration, to, uh, to take advantage of public support for space exploration to try to drive more robotic exploration of our planets, discovery of planets around other stars, search for life in the universe, and generally having a good time among the various worlds of our solar system. Now, uh, let's see if I can get my little controller to work, and if it doesn't, I can just use my computer. Yeah, it's dead. Of course it's dead. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, I love being a planetary scientist for a couple of different reasons, but the two main ones are that we get to go out with intelligent, autonomous space robots and explore strange new worlds, seek out new life and new, civil well, maybe not civilizations, but we can certainly seek out really interesting new geology, new worlds, places that we've never, environments that we can't explore on Earth. It's, it's a great adventure. And also, the other thing that I like about exploring the planets is that the questions that motivate the scientists who are going out and exploring all of these new worlds, those questions are easy for anybody to understand. I don't have to work very hard to explain why exploring these places are cool. I mean, fundamentally, we just want to know what's out there. Is there any other life out there? How did we get here? How did all these other worlds get here? All of these questions are easy to explain. The ways that we go about answering those questions are also relatively easy to explain. But just because the questions are easy to ask doesn't mean that it's easy to get to the answers. The most fundamentally important quality of somebody who goes out as a scientist trying to answer these questions is curiosity. You need to go around asking questions about the world and then finding ways to seek those answers, whether it's by experiment or by observation. Now, mostly in the planetary sciences, we do it by observation. And today, I'm going to take you to three different places in our solar system. One that's fairly close to where we are, one that's just a little bit farther away, it takes a little longer to get to, and one that's the most distant world we've ever explored in our own solar system. So let's begin at the beginning, quite close to home, with one of the very first space robots that ventured to any other world. This is Mariner 2, under construction in the mid-60s. Mariner 2 was the first spacecraft to fly by another world, Venus. And if you open up any children's book about Venus, almost everything that's written in that book about Venus will be something that Mariner 2 discovered. Mariner 2 found out that Venus rotates very slowly. Mariner 2 found out that the pressure at the surface of Venus is 90 times that of Earth's surface pressure. We found out that it has clouds that float at an elevation of like 60 kilometers above the surface and that those clouds are made of sulfuric acid. It's an absolutely nasty place. We found out <clears throat> that it's incredibly hot at the surface. It is so hot that you could melt lead if there were lead exposed at the surface. It is a horrible place. We found out all of these things more than 50 years ago. But there's so much left to learn, so we need to send more spacecraft there to learn more about our nearest neighbor. So if you traveled to Venus, this is what you would see. This is a photo taken by actually a Mercury spacecraft. It was on its way to Mercury. Its name was Messenger, and it flew past Venus on the way. This is a color photo of Venus. This is what you would see with your eyes if you went there. It is a cue ball. It is completely featureless. It is really difficult to see what's going down there on that planet uh, with just your ordinary eyes. But if we could put on ultraviolet colored glasses, we would be able to see this. 
you would see that Venus's clouds were streaked with these, with these dark streaks that outline interesting shapes swirling around the poles and making this kind of U shape across the globe. Now, the question is, what is this dark stuff that's outlining all of those features in Venus's clouds? The answer to that question is, we don't know. We don't have any idea. So we need to send some more spacecraft. Europe sent a wonderful spacecraft named Venus Express, which orbited Venus for many, many years, took lots and lots of photos of, of Venus's clouds from a wide variety of distances. You can see all these interesting features in Venus's clouds outlined by that strange dark stuff. We studied Venus for 10 years with Venus Express uh, in these long elliptical looping orbits that traveled close to the planet and then far away again. <clears throat> and we don't know what that dark stuff is made of still. We also don't know what's making the clouds move so fast. The clouds on Venus super rotate. They go all the way around Venus's atmosphere once every four Earth days, even though the whole planet takes hundreds of days to rotate. So we don't know about the clouds. We don't know why they're moving so fast. You guys don't know. Scientists don't know. How does it feel to be just as confused as the greatest scientists in the world about what's going on on Venus? Hooray! Yes, exactly. All right, so we're, we're undaunted. We're going to send another spacecraft there. This is a Japanese spacecraft that launched in 2010. Its name was Akatsuki, and it was specifically designed in order to study the atmosphere of Venus. So... Um, Venus is a relatively easy planet to get to. It only takes you a couple of months to, like four or five months in order to get there. And so Akatsuki got, got there. It started firing this main engine in order to enter orbit at Venus, and the engine blew up. It was very sad. But the spacecraft didn't die. Only the bell of the engine blew off, and it didn't finish its orbit entry uh, rocket firing. It actually shot past Venus. It had lost a little bit of its velocity, but it didn't manage to go into orbit. Akatsuki missed Venus, and two days later, it took this photo of the planet that it was supposed to enter orbit around. Bye-bye, Venus. <laughs> it's really sad. But um, Japan has showed over and over and over again in their space exploration history that they can take, as long as the spacecraft is still talking to Earth, they can salvage a mission. They were undaunted. They said, I'll be back. And Venus says, I'm waiting for you. This is an actual official publication of the Japanese Space Agency. <laughs> that was absolutely wonderful. So they came up with a daring plan. They knew that their, the orbit that they had achieved would actually take it back to Venus in six years. Their journey was supposed to be about five months, but six years they knew they would be back in Venus's neighborhood. So they're out there floating among the, the, the inner planets of the solar system. In order to enter orbit at Venus, they were going to have to make some big changes. So their spacecraft had this big engine that was supposed to help it enter orbit at Venus. They, that engine was gone. They couldn't use it anymore. They had a big fuel tank full of fuel for that engine that was now just dead weight. They did have little maneuvering rocket jets. All spacecraft have these things to help the spacecraft rotate and, and maintain its orientation in space. So out there in deep space, way far away from Venus, way far away from Earth with just the sun looking at them, they vented all of their extra fuel to space. They lightened their spacecraft by a factor of nearly two, by like 50%. And they prepared to enter orbit at Venus just using their tiny little rocket maneuvering jets. These things are designed to fire for like two or three seconds at a time. They had to fire it for many, many, many minutes. And they successfully achieved orbit at Venus on December 7th of last year. And have now, as of last month, finally started their science mission. And you can see they have... Um, a large number, I'm not going to read them all, but there's a large number of different cameras that are all designed to look at different levels of Venus's atmosphere. And this is one of the early pictures that we have back from Akatsuki. What we're looking at is a photo of Venus. The left side is bright, brilliant, uh, saturated. You can't see anything because that's the side that's being sunlit. On the right side of the globe here, what you're seeing is thermal radiation that's coming up from the hot lower atmosphere. Remember how I told you how hot Venus is? It's hot enough to melt lead. Well, you're seeing thermal radiation coming up and getting blocked by some of the clouds. So the dark things are some of the clouds at the middle altitudes on Venus. So this is a spacecraft that has numerous different ways to look at the clouds at different levels on Venus and watch how they move and rotate over time and start maybe getting us a little bit more insight into what makes the clouds on Venus move. But 
In space, whenever you go someplace and you begin to answer one question, you find new mysteries. And that was, uh, there's no difference for Akatsuki. So here is a photo taken with a long wave infrared camera um, that, that shows Venus's clouds all glowing. Um, and this was taken shortly after their orbit insertion. And you guys can see a streak running from pole to pole, from top to bottom. Okay, they took a couple photos of that as they were getting farther away from the planet. You can see that streak in both of the photos. And they were like, huh, we've never seen that at Venus before. What's that? Well, let's design some observations. When we go back on our next orbit around Venus, we'll try to answer that question. And what did they see on their next orbit around Venus? No streak. Where did it go? We don't know. <laughs> we don't have any idea where that streak went. <clears throat> How can Venus change on a global uh, basis so quickly? We have absolutely no idea. And so you go, you answer one question, you get a new mystery. Well, all right. So let's try to figure out, uh, so one thing that we do know about Venus's atmosphere uh, is that it's absolutely chock full of carbon dioxide, completely packed. This incredibly dense atmosphere, 90 times Earth pressure, is full of carbon dioxide. And this isn't at all like Earth, which is a little bit weird, because if you compare all the terrestrial planets, and the moon is an honorary terrestrial planet here, I've got them all scaled at the, at the same relative size. You can see that Earth and the Moon, I mean, sorry, Earth and Venus are roughly the same size. You, you'd think they'd be pretty much alike. They're, they're close to the same size. They're at a reasonably similar region of space, relatively close to the Sun. Um, they're made of the same materials, the same chemical elements in roughly the same proportions. Um, but carbon is behaving very differently on these two worlds. On Venus, all of the carbon that Venus has, like practically every atom of carbon on Venus, is up in the atmosphere right now. That's what's making Venus's incredibly dense atmosphere, is that all of its carbon is there. Whereas on Earth, almost all of the carbon is locked up in a specific mineral called calcite in rocks. And it's all in, buried beneath the surface. Very little of Earth's carbon is in its atmosphere. So why is all of Earth's carbon, I mean, sorry, why is all of Venus's carbon in its sky? I think maybe you guys in the front row might know the answer to that question. We don't know. <laughs> we have no idea. What made all of the carbon go up there? Um, well, the answer might possibly be on its surface. If we could just get past these annoying clouds and, and see what's going on the surface, maybe it has something to do with geology. Earth's geology kept all the carbon in its rocks. Why is Venus's geology different? Is that why there's, no, there's so much carbon in its atmosphere? Well, the surface is very hard to study because of that high pressure, because of that high temperature, and not to mention those sulfuric acid clouds that you pass through on the way down. But engineers absolutely love a challenge. And so in the 1970s and the 1980s, the Soviet Union built a series of landers called Venera to study the surface of Venus. I love Soviet spacecraft. They look so robust. <laughs> so here's one of the Veneras under construction. And you can see the fellow here is standing next to that thing that's covered with red is, uh, is the camera that was on this Venera spacecraft. And it's got sort of a panoramic view that looked up at the horizon and then swept down and then back up at the horizon. So that's what you're looking at when you see these photos from Venera 9, which landed in 1975. And you see these, cool, this is, it's all the same photo, it's just different levels of processing. And we see these interesting looking, tum these broken angular rocks. Later on, they sent more spacecraft, including Venera 13 and 14 in 1982. And you see some that play the angular rocks, but if you look on the bottom, look at those rocks. Those look flowy. They flowed out onto the surface. Those are lava rocks. Those started out as molten rock. They spilled out onto the surface and they hardened. And they look really fresh. They look like what you would see if you walked up to Kilauea, one of those fresh volcanic flows, and saw these fresh rocks lying out on the surface. So that, that begs the question, if are Venus's volcanoes actually erupting today? Are we seeing evidence for active geology on Venus? We don't know. We don't have a clue. We've been studying Venus for 50 years. We've been looking really hard for evidence that there is active volcanism on Venus. We haven't been able to rule it out. There definitely could be. 
Or Venus could have been geologically inactive for many, many, many millions of years, maybe up to half a billion years. We don't know yet. But we have learned a lot. Um, and we still have questions. And you can boil them down to one big one, which is why are Venus and Earth so very different? How did two planets that started out in such a similar way become uh, so different? And we don't know. And that's a very important question because we're working very hard right now at taking all of Earth's carbon that is locked up in its rocks and sticking it up in our atmosphere and making it a lot more like Venus. Do we risk turning Earth into Venus? Um, well, maybe when we try to answer our questions about Venus, we might be able to answer that question to our satisfaction, but we don't know the answer to that yet. Maybe some of you guys in the front row will help us figure that out because we're certainly not figuring it out right now. All right, so enough about Venus. We've, we've been confused enough by that planet. Let's, let's try to go on to someplace else and see if we can be confused over there. So I'm going to skip over. This, is a, this shows you all of the different planets in our solar system to scale in an approximately true color. Uh, we could explore Mercury or go to Mars, but I'm going to skip over those. <clears throat> I'm going to go to someplace different. We're going to add in all of the other little stuff that's in our solar system. This is everything in our solar system that is big enough to be round or round-ish. So we're going to go to one spot that's up there in the asteroid belt, this little guy way up here. All right, so here is a Hubble Space Telescope photograph of this object. It's not particularly impressive with Hubble. We can zoom in a little bit and we can see this is the third biggest asteroid in the asteroid belt. This thing's name is Vesta. And this is pretty much the best view that we could get from a Vesta with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Now Vesta is a member of the asteroid belt. It's part of the main belt. It's part of the, uh, it's sort of toward the interior of the main belt. The asteroid belt is a, is a relic of the formation of the solar system. It's, it was what was left over when all of the stuff that coalesced to form the planets, it didn't quite manage to do that in this particular region of space because Jupiter's enormous mass disrupted the, the formation process that, that tended to allow the other planets to, to coalesce. So we have all of these little worlds that are trapped in the asteroid belt <clears throat> that are sort of a, a time capsule of what the solar system looked like when it was first forming. So it would be really interesting if, if we could explore places like Vesta and maybe answer some questions about how Earth formed. Because we don't have good records on Earth of what Earth looked like four and a half billion years ago, but maybe by studying these asteroids, we could learn a little bit more about what Earth was like when it was first forming. So this is the best photo that we had of Vesta as of 2010. Um, here are some things you can learn about it. You can, you can see that it's lumpy which is a little strange because it's very large. It's about uh, uh, 500, 600 kilometers in diameter. And, and moons that are that size tend to be round. But, but Vesta has this squished shape, which is very strange. Um, we can tell that it's made of rock, uh, just like Earth and, and most of the other asteroids are. It's not the same color everywhere. It's got some different colors in different places. And so one of the big questions that we have is why is Vesta so lumpy? We can't answer that question just with our Earth-based uh, telescopes, but fortunately, we are a spacefaring nation, and we can launch a spacecraft to go visit it. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. There's one more thing I wanted to mention about Vesta that makes Vesta an especially interesting place to study. And that's that Vesta is one of the few places in the solar system from which we actually have samples. So there is a large population of meteorites on the surface of Earth that we're pretty sure from the colors of the minerals that we can see in the meteorite compared to the colors on the surface of Vesta, we were pretty certain that this large population of meteorites was blasted off of Vesta by some ancient impact and they came down to the surface of Earth. We weren't 100% positive though. Right? I don't even know if we can say we were 80% positive, but it seemed pretty likely. Um, we would really like to know if they really came from Vesta, because if they did, then, then we have lots and lots of samples. And there are very few places in the solar system from which we actually have pieces of rock that we can study in a mineralogical laboratory. So what does Vesta look like up close? Well, we can go check that out with a spacecraft named Dawn. We launched Dawn in 2007. And it took a long time for it to get to Vesta. The problem is, that when you are visiting a place that doesn't have very much mass, it's not very big, it doesn't have very much gravity, and it can't grab you into orbit very well. When you're visiting Venus, you can uh, use the planet's gravity to help you 
tug you into orbit. When you're visiting Vesta, you need to arrive with a, 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 a velocity and a direction of motion that is rather similar to Vesta's direction of motion around the sun, or else you'll never have any chance of getting into orbit. So it took four years for Dawn to match orbits with Vesta. But finally, in uh, 2011, it began to get pictures. This was Dawn's very first picture of Vesta. You can see that we're not doing better than Hubble yet. Hubble is a really big, really powerful, really awesome telescope. And you actually have to get quite close to a place in order for this, the tiny camera, the relatively small cameras that are on spacecraft to do a better job than Hubble. Um, but fortunately, we can do that. With Dawn, we got a lot closer. And here is what it began to look like in June of 2011. I was super excited about this mission because this was the first time in my adult life that we approached a planet-sized world for the, for the first, that we had never laid our eyes on before. So this, this world is coming into focus for the first time. It was just a point of light, and now it's going to become a place with geology. So a couple weeks later, what a strange looking place. Check out those craters. So all these craters are bowl-shaped, but, but what are all those whirly ridges? That's bizarre. But at least we know what Vesta looks like. We answered that question, right? <laughs> OK, yay for us. All right. So now we know what Vesta looks like. But, but why does it look like that? Well, we can answer a, one of our questions that we had about its shape. We know why it's so lumpy. Um, because we can see that on the south pole of Vesta, there's this funky nose. That nose is actually the central peak of an enormous impact crater that takes up all of Vesta's southern hemisphere. But after Don continued mapping Vesta for a little while, we discovered something slightly strange. And that's that if you look at a topographic map, so now we're looking at topography where reds and yellows are high elevation and greens down to blues are low elevation, you can actually see that there are two enormous basically the same size impact basins right on top of each other, right on the South Pole. The odds of that are really low. The odds of two same-sized enormous impacts happening in the same place on this small, out-of-the-way little world um, that, are, that just happen to be not quite big enough to blow the whole thing to smithereens, the odds of that are really low. How is it possible that there could have been two same-sized impacts in the same place on this little body we don't know, OK? We don't have a clue. <laughs> but uh, it sure is interesting. We learned this about Vesta. OK, so we learned a lot of other interesting things about Vesta. Here is a color photograph of Vesta. It's actually a fairly colorful place as, as, uh, as rocky bodies go. You can see that it has a lot of horizontal grooves cutting the surface. This is actually common to a lot of small worlds in our solar system. We see these grooves. And by mapping the orientations of those grooves, scientists have figured out that they are circumferential to those two big impact basins. So we know that they're connected to those impact basins in some way. But, but what are they? I mean, scientists have some ideas, like maybe uh, you shattered the entire interior of this world when you impacted it like that, and, and it made cracks that have then uh, dust and rock has fallen down into the cracks and made these grooves. That's one idea. Or maybe those are frozen in earthquake waves where the whole thing, the whole world was shaking like a bell when it got struck. And, and then at some point, the, the shaking and the strength of the rock kind of balance each other out. And, and I don't know, none of these is very satisfying to me. <laughs> so I think we still don't know the answer to that question. We know that there's something that happens on small bodies, but we don't know why. <clears throat> Here's another thing that I, that I really like about Vesta. Its impact craters look weird. Okay, So here's a relatively fresh impact crater on Vesta. Uh, we call it the snowman, for obvious reasons. Um, is this? It, it could be two things that hit at the same time. Maybe it was a little binary asteroid that this slammed into Vesta. It's got this funky, moundy surface. And uh, I don't know, these, these do not look like ordinary craters. Um, and we, we don't know why, why Vesta's impact craters look like this. Another crater that's cool to look at is this one that's right in the center of Vesta. This one's name is Cornelia. And if you look at it close up, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely lovely. It's got these dark streaks and these bright streaks all running down the interior. And many of Vesta's fresh craters have these dark streaks and these light streaks. What's up with these two-tone craters? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know why 
there is such a wide variety of color in in Vesta's impact craters. Is it something that started inside Vesta? Is the interior of Vesta made of many different materials and we're just seeing those materials being exposed in the walls? Or did we, uh, did all of the stuff that came in and impacted Vesta bring in dark material that got deposited here and there and in other places and we're seeing that exposed? Maybe it came from outside. If it came from outside, was it all from a single impact that sprayed it all over the world? Or was it from multiple different impacts coming in? There's a ton of disagreement. Scientists have no idea. So again, you guys are exactly as confused as the scientific community is about what's going on on Vesta. Are we concave yes, this is a concave area. Yeah, it, it, it can be hard to, if, you're, if your brain wants to make this into a mountain, you're not alone. It happens a lot. <laughs> Try like twisting your head upside down and maybe it'll turn into a, into a crater for you. So Don got to Vesta, it answered quite a few of the questions that we had about Vesta and left us with even more questions than we had arrived with. And then Don had to leave. So this photo was taken on August 25th, 2012 as uh, Don began to depart from Vesta. We'd gone, we'd seen this new world and left behind with many, many questions. So why did Don have to leave? Well, it's because Don is the very first mission ever to depart the Earth-Moon system and to go to another world. And so Don left, uh, left Vesta in order that it could travel to Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. And again, this is a Hubble photo. This is the best we could do from the greatest telescope ever sent into orbit uh, with the appearance of the asteroid Ceres. Now, one of the things you can see in the Hubble photos of Ceres, first of all, you can tell that Ceres is a very different shape from Vesta. Ceres is not lumpy. Ceres is beautifully round. It's the only world in the asteroid belt that is, that is round in this way, that's kind of planet-like in that way. So with that roundness, uh, we also know something about the composition of the surface of Ceres. It's icier. Ceres is located farther out in the asteroid belt. It's closer to Jupiter. It's in a place where when it was first forming, it, it dragged different kinds of ices into it. And so Ceres, it's round, it's icy. Maybe it's a lot like a solar system moon, but maybe it's more like an asteroid. We don't, we don't know which one of those things it is. So again, we need to send a spacecraft to visit it. One other thing you may have noticed about this little spinning uh, image of Ceres up here is that there's a couple of very bright spots that are rotating around on the surface. Uh, those brilliant spots that you could see from Earth. And the general idea was that here we have an icy world and it's located, uh, it's, it's got a generally dark surface, but we know it's got some, some ice in its composition. So easy enough conclusion, you slammed this world with an asteroid, with a smaller asteroid. It ex excavated ice from under the surface, sprayed it out across the surface and you get a nice bright spot. Okay, that's a pretty, uh, that's the kind of thing that a space geologist can come up with in, in their sleep, you know, no problem. Okay, so what is that bright spot? Probably ice, we'll figure it out when we get there. All right, so this is one of Don's earliest images of Ceres. And that bright spot is still there. And it's really bright. It's very bright. Um, approaching Ceres closer and closer. You can see the bright spot is still there. Closer and closer, the bright spot has actually separated into two bright spots. The funny thing about these photos is that they kept on stepping down the exposure so that they could try to see what was going on in that bright spot. And no matter how, uh, how quickly they exposed the image, it was still saturating. It was still the brightest thing that you could image. They still couldn't get any detail because it was so bright it was saturating the, the detector. Got even closer. This bright spot is breaking up into more and more and more bright spots. They finally get into a fairly low orbit where they can map in very high resolution. This is a uh, mosaic of many images. The, the toothy edge is because the camera is taking photo after photo after photo after photo after photo, and they're puzzle piecing them all together to make a very high resolution view of this world. So let's zoom in and see what these things look like as we get closer and closer. And again, we're saturating the image here. It's really hard to tell what's going on but it's looking less and less like a spray of fresh material that's been sprayed out of the crater by an impact splashing into it. Um, what you can see is that there's a lot of fractures in the bottom of the crater and there's, 
there's, there's like these little spots here, there, and everywhere. What is this stuff? Well, finally, they managed to get some images that were not saturated and were in color. And that's what it looks like. <laughs> what the heck is that? Okay. Um, if, you're, if you've ever taken a structural geology class, you might recognize the fact that there are a lot of uh, uh, fractures in sort of a star pattern. Well, actually, you don't have to have taken a structural geology class to recognize this pattern. If you've ever baked a snickerdoodle cookie, okay, and you see how those cookies, they get sort of a crust on top and then they expand as you bake them. As they stretch out, the crust breaks up and it, and it makes this sort of radial, the star pattern of cracks. Okay, this is the snickerdoodle cookie in the center of this crater on Ceres. Something has pushed up from below and domed up this center of this crater and, and made it crack in this star shape. And not only that, but it's got a reddish color on top there compared to like the more bluish color everywhere else. Also, if you look off onto the right side, you'll see there's more, less bright, bright material. And it's all around these, these little circular features that are running along fractures. This is all screaming volcanic type activity to me. And yet it still doesn't make any sense. How can you have that kind of activity on a tiny icy world in the asteroid belt that presumably hasn't changed a whole lot since it formed in, you know, more than four billion years ago. And again, we don't know what that thing is. Uh, we do know that it's not ice now though. They have spectrometers on this spacecraft that can tell us what that's, or can at least give us some hints as to what the stuff is that's making that bright deposit. It's not ice, it's salt. It's some kind of salty compound. Now, a world that started out with lots of ice probably melted at some point. It probably had an internal ocean at some point. There's a very outside chance that it could actually have an internal liquid layer of water today. It's fairly unlikely, but it's possible. And so any place that had a lot of water would have had a lot of salt dissolved in that water. And if you froze the whole ocean, you would be seg segregating out the salt and depositing it somewhere, but it wouldn't be close to the surface. And now in geology, we know that there are salt domes. The salt is low density. It can rise up in the surface. So you can, you can construct a story that can explain this, but you can't exactly test that story with the data that we have yet. So we still don't really know. We can't be sure what's going on. But we do know it's a heck of a lot more interesting than anything we anticipated before we traveled there, which is one of the things that makes space exploration so wonderful is that for all of the work you can do to predict what you're going to find, you find things that are stranger than you ever imagined. What is the scale? That's a good question. Um, we're looking at uh, many kilometers across, uh, tens of kilometers, I think, uh, but I don't know precisely. <clears throat> um, we don't, uh, yeah, we can't tell. Um, you can tell that it's reddish, but I don't know that they have determined what makes it reddish. The problem is a lot of stuff in space is red. You get red materials in a lot of different ways. And so there's the spectrometer data isn't enough to tell you precisely which thing it is that's, that's making it that red color. All right, so we're going to go to one more place in the solar system. Uh, we're going to skip over all of those giant planets. We're going to skip over even the medium-sized planets, what they now call the ice giants toward the end of the solar system. We're going to go to that little cruft that's in the corner down there, the little dust out at the end of the solar system that turns out to contain more than 200 round worlds. That's the Kuiper belt. There are more round worlds in the Kuiper belt than there are in all of the rest of the solar system. But of course, there's one world that's more popular than any of those other Kuiper belt worlds, and that's Pluto. Okay, so that little pair is just one of many interesting round worlds in the Kuiper belt, but there's only one that we've ever sent a spacecraft to. This is, these are the discovery images of Pluto. It was discovered in 1930, which was not very long ago. And this is the pretty much the best, we, well, it's not quite the best we can do from Hubble, but this is one of the early Hubble photos of it. You can see there's a great big bright spot and there's a slightly less bright spot. That's Pluto's large moon, Charon. And then there's two somewhat dimmer spots. Those are the first two of Pluto's small moons to be discovered, Nix and Hydra. So of course, we would love to know what Pluto actually looks like, but we can't do a lot better than this without a spacecraft. They did do a lot of mapping of Pluto with, uh, with Hubble, 
And they, they used this cool technique where they did mutual occultations of Pluto and Charon, and they used supercomputers to figure out what was causing the colors and the different images to change. And they managed to map the surface of Pluto and came up with this somewhat lumpy, bumpy looking map that showed us, we can't really see geography on this map, but what we can see is that Pluto is very colorful. Pluto is bright in some places and dark in others. Uh, there's a particularly bright spot that comes into view that's on the equator right there. And there's also some very dark spots on the equator. <clears throat> Most places in the solar system do not have this much color variation. Most places are either all dark or all bright. Only something like Iapetus, Saturn's two-faced moon, is quite as colorful as Pluto was. Well, the story got stranger. They did the same kind of work on Pluto um, two separated years, 1994 and 2003, and they noticed that the blotches on the surface, oops, they changed position. And I don't see the, oh shoot, I didn't put the 2003 map on there. You'll have to take my word for it. They changed position. <laughs> so, oh. oh, there it goes. Fabulous. Okay. Finally. They changed. How is Pluto changing so much so quickly? We don't know, okay? We didn't know, but we had some guesses. So Pluto is an interesting outer solar system world in that it has an atmosphere. And here's an artist's concept of what its atmosphere looks like. It's not a thick atmosphere like Earth's or Venus's, but it's not a thin atmosphere either. It's, it's thick enough that it has weather. It has wind. It could have clouds. And so wherever you have weather with clouds and wind, you could change the appearance of a surface just by putting down frost over here and taking it away from over there. So that was our best idea of what was going on on Pluto before we finally sent a spacecraft. But the atmosphere, although it allowed us to explain what was going on on Pluto's surface, it also hid a major fundamental important piece of information about Pluto, and that's its diameter. Because the atmosphere was thick enough that it blocked our view of stars passing close to, the, to Pluto, that, which is the way that we figure out how big things are in the outer solar system. We watch as the world goes across a star and we time it. We time how long it takes to go across the star and from that timing we can figure out its diameter. You do that with Pluto and the atmosphere focuses the starlight like a lens and it makes this big flash and you can't tell where exactly Pluto's edge is. So we didn't actually know how big Pluto was before we flew past it. We didn't even know if it was the biggest thing in the Kuiper belt or not because there's another world named Eris for which we had very good size information that was within error the same size as Pluto. So. Spacecraft to the rescue. We launched New Horizons in 2007, and it's been flying ever since. It's one of the fastest spacecraft that's ever left Earth's orbit. Um, and it flew, it got to Jupiter in just one year, and it took nearly 10 years to get to Pluto. That's how far away Pluto is. But it finally flew past Pluto last July. <clears throat> so this was one of the first images that New Horizons took of Pluto in 2013, when it was still quite far away. It was the first image where you could actually separate Charon's light from Pluto's light using New Horizons. It wasn't until about two months before the flyby that we really began to do any better than Hubble. So this is an image of Pluto and Charon orbiting each other in space, and you can see about as much detail as we were able to see in those Hubble photos. You notice something funny about how the two are orbiting each other? They're kind of like a dumbbell spinning around itself in space. That's because Charon is so large compared to Pluto that Charon is exerting a large gravitational pull on Pluto, and the two are mutually orbiting the system barycenter, a spot in space that is outside of Pluto. It's well above Pluto's surface. Pluto is orbiting that spot, and Charon is orbiting that spot, and they're rotating together, spinning through space like a giant cosmic dumbbell, which is really awesome. But we still weren't seeing very much detail on the surface. This is as good as you can see uh, Pluto's surface from those early May images. Pluto actually looks a little like Vesta on the left side, doesn't it? it? Made a lot of people think that Pluto was actually lumpy and not round. But the reason that it looks like that is because some parts of Pluto's surface are so dark, they're just kind of blending in with space. And as we got closer, we began to see details on Pluto's surface. It began to transform into a world with geology. 
uh, not just a dot of light in space. So we were, this is early July, we're two weeks before the flyby, we're getting excited, getting ready to see these up-close images of Pluto, and New Horizons' computer crashed on July 4th. The entire team, they'd taken like, they, they'd been working so hard for weeks and months, they, they were just taking their July 4th holiday, they were at picnics with family, and their, their phones all started ringing, the spacecraft is not talking to Earth, they went into safe mode. Well, it turns out that the spacecraft had been asked to perform three tasks at once that were just too much for the computer. It gave up. It said, I, I'm sorry, I can't do this. It, give me less to do. <laughs> so it turned to Earth. They actually managed to recover it pretty quickly. But it was a terrifying couple of days because they had traveled for 10 years to get to Pluto. They were a week away, and the spacecraft shut down. But they saved it. Okay, so... July 9th, 11th, and 12th, this is what Pluto looked like. One of the difficult things with doing a, a spacecraft reconnaissance of Pluto is that the, it spins so slowly, it spins once every six days, that you, you don't get to survey the whole thing spinning like you would if you were approaching Earth. You, you get only, you know, you're, you're traveling so far, you're a week away from it, and you get your last look at certain parts of the surface that are going to be turning away for you, from you for the whole flyby. Okay, so July 9th, 11th, 12th, we're getting these tantalizing images of the surface, and then nothing. But don't worry, <laughs> this part was planned. So New Horizons is a small spacecraft traveling 31 times farther away from Earth uh, than Earth is from the sun. And it's got a big radio dish, but when you're that far away, your radio dish is very weak. You, you have to point precisely at Earth in order to communicate with Earth. And when you're getting close on the flyby, you don't have time to like radio Earth all the time. You need to point your cameras and everything at Pluto. So the spacecraft turned away from Earth and spent all of its time on the close flyby pointing all these different directions at, at Pluto, at Charon, at the moons, and it wasn't talking to Earth for this whole time. They did one really quick thing that they called the phone home right after the flyby saying, hi, I'm okay, okay, I'm going to go back to work now. And it went back to work and it kept working. And then uh, overnight, the day after the flyby, boom. That's what Pluto looks like. Yay, we answered our question. We know what Pluto looks like now. It is awesome. And then, boom, New Horizons was past Pluto. And this is what Pluto looks like from behind. Okay, I want you to think for a moment about what it takes to see Pluto from behind. You have to have a spacecraft that has traveled billions of kilometers and still be pointing precisely at Earth and talking to Earth and sent us this photo of Pluto from behind, you're seeing its atmosphere backlit by the sun. You are seeing all of Pluto's sunrises and sunsets at the same time backlit by the sun. It's an absolutely glorious image. And New Horizons was traveling very fast to get there and it kept traveling and Pluto diminished into space and New Horizons is now long past it, can't see Pluto anymore but it is continuing to send us tons and tons of data. It's going to continue sending us data throughout the rest of this year because it's so far away, it takes about five hours for it to send one photo to Earth. That radio signal is that weak. So it's gonna take an entire year to send back all of its data. One of the early things that it sent back was something that I regard as one of the greatest photos taken in all of planetary exploration history. This is a view taken shortly after closest approach that shows you both the, the crescent sunlit surface of Pluto and its many layered atmosphere. It's tilted up and you can see all the layers in its atmosphere up there. Those are something called gravity waves. All right, we can zoom in on that a little bit and you can see Pluto's mountains. Uh, the fact that you can see into the shadowed parts of Pluto's mountains tells you that the atmosphere itself is scattering sunlight. So if you were standing in the shadow of Pluto's mountains, you would see a bright sky. After sunset, lighting up the sky and allowing you to see around you on the surface of Pluto. It's just amazing. All right, <clears throat> so 
One of the early results from the New Horizons mission, we now know exactly how big Pluto is. It is 2,374 kilometers in diameter, 1,475 miles, and just a hair bigger than Eris. So Pluto is now again recrowned the king of the Kuiper Belt. It is the largest thing out there. Another thing we learned is what that big bright spot was on the surface. Okay, it happens to correspond exactly with this heart-shaped feature, this bright heart on the, uh, on the equator of Pluto. So what is that heart? Um, well, we have some spectral information. We know it's made of multiple different kinds of ice, methane, nitrogen, carbon monoxide ice. You zoom up close to it, you can zoom into its edge, and I'll show you one of the things that just blew my mind about this flyby. So we're here at the edge of the, of the heart, going up into some mountains on Pluto. Do you see that little squirty kind of shape in the ice? There, is, there are glaciers flowing on Pluto, but they're not water ice glaciers. Water ice behaves as hard as rock does here on Earth. Those are glaciers made of carbon monoxide and nitrogen ice flowing across the surface of Pluto like toothpaste over time. Um, and so this is, this is an unimaginably cold and distant world. You would think it had been locked in an icebox forever, but it's, it's moving, it's geologically active. It's got flowing glaciers on the surface. It has this other kind of terrain. They call this uh, uh, snakeskin terrain, this blade terrain that they're not sure what makes the surface. We don't know what geology is happening here. Maybe it has to do with the atmosphere. Maybe we're seeing ice blades made by sublimation in the desert arid climate on, on Pluto. I don't know, sounds plausible. Um, we have over here at the edge of the heart, we have these interesting looking blocky mountains and you zoom in up close to them and you can see that some of them have little layers. We're seeing broken up crust of Pluto that's been tipped up and scientists think that we're looking at water ice blocks that are flowing in solid carbon monoxide ice out into Pluto's heart. Again, crazy to have active geology on such a distant world. How can such a tiny distant world be so varied? We don't know, we don't have a clue, but isn't it awesome that we can get these photos and look at it and ask all these questions about what Pluto looks like. And so uh, New Horizons is gonna be continuing to give us fascinating science for years to come as this data come down to Earth. So I'm gonna close up by talking about uh, what we have next to do in exploration of the solar system. What you're looking at here is a comparison of every round world in the solar system that's smaller than Venus. And it starts out with a planet, with Mars, and then it goes into the smaller and smaller worlds, Ganymede, Titan, Mercury, Callisto and Io are moons of, of uh, Jupiter. Our moon comes next, Europa, another moon of Jupiter. Triton, a moon of Neptune that may well be a captured Kuiper Belt object. Um, if, if it had stayed in the Kuiper Belt, it would have been the king of the Kuiper Belt. It's bigger than Pluto. You can see Pluto there, and then we begin to see these, these shapes that, that don't actually have photographed surfaces yet. Today, I've, I've talked with you about Vesta. You can see Vesta way down there in the corner, and Ceres, and Pluto. These are three absolutely fascinating worlds, and they're all quite small. These are not planets. They're not even close to planets. They're way smaller than a lot of the moons in the solar system, but does that make them any less fascinating than any of the planets? Absolutely not. And as a matter of fact, most of the worlds that we want to explore next to answer our questions about the solar system, how it formed and why it looks like it does, those are going to be answered by studying these smaller worlds, places like Europa, where there's a subsurface ocean. Ganymede has an ocean and a magnetic field. Um, Enceladus, way down there in the corner, is spewing geysers into space, making a gigantic ring of, around Saturn. Titan has flowing rivers of liquid methane running across its surface, pouring into ethane lakes, evaporating into methane clouds, and raining again on the surface. It has a whole methane cycle operating on its surface. And then there's all the Kuiper Belt objects, which I'm just showing you as little half moons here because we don't know what they look like. We know their colors, and this is a diagram made before the Pluto flyby, so you can see how Pluto looks in terms of color and brightness compared to all these other worlds in the Kuiper Belt. Orcus, Quawar, ha Haumea, Varuna, Ixion, Sedna. They all have wonderful names, and we've never seen any of them up close, and it's quite likely they are as interesting as Pluto. 
So we have all these other worlds to explore. They're not planets. They're absolutely fascinating. We have more questions than we will ever answer. And every time we answer some questions, we generate even more questions. And that makes space exploration absolutely awesome. So thank you very much for paying attention to me this morning. I'll answer your questions.